Amen. We want to continue from, um, we started a, a topic, a marriage made in heaven, and we want to um, conclude with that. But I just want to recap briefly. I'm just going to go over the areas that we've, um, we've covered, and for the sake of time, we're just going to go straight through into the second part of it. But I just want to recap um, on what we've covered, and if you want to know... Um, that is on the internet, it's on our website, um, the um, first part of the, um, of the teaching that we did on that. But we began with what every man and woman should know before they begin a relationship um, that leads to marriage. And one of those things was in the, obviously in the dating stages, oftentimes as Christians, we date somebody once or twice and we're already thinking marriage and we've not gathered um, what we call pertinent information. And um, before I um, decide I'm going to marry somebody with the intent of spending the rest of my life with them, which can be 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, however long that may be, it's important that we understand um, am I prepared to live with the things that that person's going to bring into my life. So we talked about gathering pertinent information, which we continue to encourage you as single people. You can't ignore them um, because they will come up and you have to deal with them. And I always say it's easier to deal with, with the terms and conditions before you sign the contract. So gather pertinent information. Does he or she have a relationship with God? Because that will affect your marriage. Um, how is his or her church attendance? Because if they don't love God, they're not going to love you like that. Um, their church commitment, are they just attendees, visitors in a church, or are they committed to the church? Because that tells you that whether that person can commit. If you can't commit on this basis, then as soon as a problem comes in your relationship, if, if they lack commitment, then they will lack commitment when the problem arises in your relationship and they'll be out the door. Um, church commitment, are they actively involved in church? Their consistency, are they in church every single week? Or are they in church once in a blue moon? Are they hit and miss um, with their church attendance? All of those things are important information that you need to gather before you even start thinking down the road of um, long-term as in marriage. Then another area that we, um, we covered was upbringing because it does make a difference. And, you know, what are, your, what are your cultural differences? And you can be from the same country and have cultural differences. Cultural differences, how I was raised in my house and how he was raised. And that was one of the problems that we struggled with because the way I was raised and the, the model that was modeled to me by my dad was a different model that he had from his father. So I went into marriage thinking he was going to be like my dad. My dad was in the kitchen. My dad never had a problem cooking. Um, to this day, my dad would bring me tea and toast in bed. Um, even my kids today still go around there. And my, my dad still does things like that. So when I got married, I wasn't looking for tea and toast in bed. But he had a totally different um, mindset with his dad. I was looking for tea and toast in bed. <laughs> his dad would sit there and his mom waited on him. I have never seen his dad. The most I ever saw his dad do was um, he would sometimes times go in the kitchen and maybe help her season the meat but he never cooked never cleaned he sat in his chair never sat around a dining table which my family always ate around a table um, so when I saw him, met him his dad's dinner table was his lap a tray in front of the TV and I was so cultural differences is not necessarily oh we're from different countries but just your different upbringings Chris, you'd be surprised at the arguments that will cause a relationship if you don't find those things out. How was he or she raised? What role did the father play in the home? Ladies, if his, if, if his father was abusive to his mom, more than likely he's going to do that to you because he's, that's what he was modeled before him. That's all he knows. A man will respond according to the, um, the template of what his father um, how his father acted out before him. A woman will be the same. How my mother, even though we think I'm never going to be like my mother. You know what? As soon as you get into the role of your mom, you start like what my mother used to do that and you you don't realize because that's what's modeled. We human beings learn through nurturing. And the home and how we were nurtured is who we become as adults. 
And that's why it's important as Christian parents that you are modeling the right nurture to your children according to how you want them to be. So a Christian men, if you're lazy and you never spend time with God, guess what? That's what you're modeling for your sons. Amen? So those were the important things. What role did the mother play? But also here with the mother, it's really important because how many of you have ever had problems with your mother-in-law? Serious, some people have serious problems. So you have to also understand and watch the relationship the man has with his mother. Because if he's a mummy's boy, you could have a living nightmare on your hands. And we always tell people uh, that when you get married, you set boundaries. But what some of you do, you're so keen to get married, you ignore all the signs. You know, one time I, I, a, f a friend had broken down in Sheffield and I was, I was gonna be the champion. I'm gonna drive to Sheffield, even though I had an old bang of a car. And my wife's saying, are you sure? Do you think you should do this? And there's another lady in the car saying, do you think you should do this? Maybe we shouldn't do this. But you know, when you're blindsided, you blindsided, you just you insist on doing it your way. No one could speak to you. We take no advice. And I kept going and kept going. By the time I got to Junction 2, the alternator went. By the time I got near Sheffield, that I was driving the car with no lights on the motorway, pitch black, driving behind other people, car broke down. I got, I had to, the, the person I went to meet, whilst he was, it was freezing cold, we're standing there, he had a coat on. I said to him, could you give my wife your coat? He said, you must be joking. This is the same guy I drove to Sheffield to get. And on the way back, we had to hire a car, which we didn't have money for. I got stopped for speeding. All this because I would not listen. And many of us are like that. We don't listen. And your generation think you know best. And the Bible clearly tells us there's safety in the multitude of counselors. And some of you don't want counsel because the counsel is not going to be in line with what you want. Because you already have a preconceived idea how you want it, what you're going to do. And if God doesn't do it, you're going to make it happen. And remember this, when you're dating, when you're dating, it's like the same thing that sunk the Titanic. They looked at the iceberg and thought it was only little icebergs. But every iceberg, if you look at it, it goes way, way below what you can see. And when you see a man displaying anger or a woman displaying anger, I would, I would be afraid to marry a woman who has an anger problem because you don't know if you're going to wake up because some of them are very vindictive. So when you see someone with anger, if they're abusive in the early stages, you need to pay attention because it runs much deeper than that. In the lessons we learn, everything that's presented is to help us make a choice of what we want to do with the rest of our lives. The subjects we hated studying is supposed to try and give you a vision of whether you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant or whatever. So um, it's, it's normal for people to have a vision, but oftentimes when we leave school, because the motivation or the pushing is no longer there, we sit down. And we don't, we, uh, our progress um, b grinds to a halt. So I just want to encourage you. Um, you should have vision. There should be an indication around your life of the vision. Because if I say I have a vision to be a doctor, there, should, there would be evidence. There would be my degree where I studied. I went to university and I've studied. I'm now practicing. So if there's a vision, it's normal for you to be able to see it. A vision, if it's just in your head, you're just a dreamer. Can you say amen? So we, we, we look for vision because especially for, from a perspective, um, it's important for men and women to have vision. But for me, it's important that he's a visionary because he's leading the family. He's the head of the home. So if he has no vision, he's not taking us anywhere. So look for somebody that has vision. And it's good to have vision because a, a person that vi has vision is somebody that's positive. It doesn't matter how many knocks they take in life, they get back up again because the vision propels them. But, but a good thing to, when you meet somebody, is just say to them, when they talk about marriage and stuff like that, just say, what do you see for the next five years? What do you see? And they're, um, 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 no, um, doesn't put bread on the table. What do you see as a family? How do you see us progressing as a family? When we have children, what do you see? How do you see your children being raised? 
But would you see us buying our own property? Yeah. Would you see us buying a property? How are we going to do that? How will, it, how will that happen if you don't get out your bed? Hmm. The Bible tells you if you want to prosper, just be diligent. It tells you if you want to be broke, just lay down and fold your arms. It's very straightforward. So before you commit to somebody, you need to find out. Let me tell you, ladies, there's nothing worse than being married to someone with no vision. It, you cannot imagine anything worse than a man who thinks all he's got to do is sit down and do nothing. Sit back and take his ease. And whilst you're, the bills are piling up and he's got, it'll be okay. No, it will not be okay. And listen to me, there's times, if you don't get a man that the, the next thing we touched on was pride. If you don't get a man that has not, if you get a man that has not dealt with his pride, that man will take you down to the gutter because of his pride. I would work any job as long as I don't go to prison for it. I'd clean the streets. I'd do whatever it took to put bread on the table so that my family would have some sense of self-worth. But if you get a man who's too arrogant and too prideful to lower himself to work and sit around all day, let me tell you, have you ever been unemployed? Everyone ever been unemployed? Yeah. After a while, you notice after, uh, after about six months, laziness begins to set in. After about a year, you, you're looking for jobs not to get. You're looking for jobs outside of your scope to justify why you're, why you're still sitting home. After two years, you've lost it. it you, 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 you will always find an excuse why you cannot be who you're supposed to be. I would, I'm prepared. If I had to, I'd go pack a shelf in Tesco's or Safeways at night and do something else during the day to keep me employed so I could provide for my family. The basic as men, we are, men are providers. And I don't know about you, if I can't provide, I'm a most miserable man. Because I want to be able to say, what would you like for dinner? Let's go here. Let's go there. It's a natural instinct for a man to be a provider. If that man does not have that instinct, ladies, you are in deep, deep trouble. I mean, let me just finish up with those ones that we covered on uh, Visionary. Are they a finisher? Do they start something, and, but they never finish it? Being a finisher is important. What have they thought about doing or yourself and have never done it? What have they got to show for all their years on planet Earth? Those were some of the things that we covered. And we began in um, what we called um, competition. Or, I, I can't remember competition. if that was the right word, but this, um, we've, we've named it the Jones Syndrome or this, keeping this, up with the Joneses. This is a thing coming to church now. You know, I don't know about other churches, but I have seen it in this church. I've seen it with, it's like a competition about weddings. Now, let me explain to you. A wedding, the day, the cake, the dress. Most women in this room that got married five years ago, six years ago, you cannot fit into the dress again. Okay, you don't want to talk about that. Okay, but here it is. A wedding is just a ceremony. And when you marry somebody and you're trying to get them to be like somebody else, what we call the Jones Syndrome is a spirit of competition where the size of the ring is more important than where we're going to live. And we're trying to compare bling bling across the room. You know, and we're talking like this. Oh, such a hard day and we're trying to show our ring. You know what, when you marry somebody, I have never bought my wife an engagement ring. Never, 36 years, and I've never bought her an engagement ring. She still has the ring today that I bought the, the ring for 18 pounds. 18 pounds was what we paid for the ring. It is what I could afford at the time. And some of you, you wanted to start up here and don't understand that life is progressive. Yeah. So what you're trying to do, you look at someone, what someone bought for somebody else, and now you're trying to put that, and men, don't get off the hook that easy and say, preach it, pastor, preach it, because some of you can do better, but you're just tight. <laughs> so don't think you're going to get off and say, yes, you see, elbow, you see, now let's go back to, to that store I saw that ring for 80 pounds, Argos. Now... <laughs> What we do now 
See, I bought my wife the best that was to my ability. That was what I could afford. But it was not my satisfaction to leave it there. But when you're getting married and you're getting married through competition, you're put in pressure and you're blindsided because you can't see the future. Because what you're doing, instead of looking at where you are and who you're with, you're actually trying to be like somebody else. So I'm doing my wedding not because, you know, uh, there's, there's some have weddings in hotels and some will have weddings, you know, in special venues. But you may be at the place where you may need to go to a community center. You may not even be able to go to a community center. You may just have, don't shake your head, ladies. You're like, no, no, no. Don't do like Shola. It doesn't change the vocals. <laughs> Sorry, Shola. Shola. But some of you may not even be able to afford that. You may be with three or four friends in a registry office and go to a, a restaurant or a pub or whatever and just say, Congratulations. But you, you know what, I think um, th there's this um, level that I think people think that there is, that their wedding has to meet up to, that you have to have 150, 200, 250 guests, you have to have a particular style of dress, a ring has to be a certain, who says? Um, I think you have to make it your own. Um, don't try to be like anyone else. Don't try to do it like anyone else. You, um, what you have between you make it happen from that um when you you get into trouble when you're looking over here at how so and so done it how many guests so and so had how big so and so's dress and ring and etc was but we were in um we were in italy a while ago and there was a young couple there and they got married straight out of uni um, they were from america and we were talking to them and i think they had about 20 or 30 guests at their no, wedding no. No, the you first weren't. One. No, you weren't there. Oh. It was me and the girls, and um, there was they had about. That's another no, no, because we were talking to a couple, so I thought it was that one. They got married the first time. They had three hundred and fifty guests, and they divorced. And on this one, they say she got married six years ago, and they go back to Italy every year because that's where he proposed. And the second way, then they had five guests because they said after three hundred and fifty guests, the presents didn't add up to one decent one. So what you're trying to do when you have this grand affair, you, you actually be careful you're not trying to impress people. It, it, it's pride where you're trying to say, I had this big wedding, but you, you, you leave the wedding. And let me tell you, well, after the marriage, there's always a dip. It's like going up on, the, on that Hi. thing in the, in the park. Escalate. No, that thing in the park, those roller coaster thing. And then you're up the top, it went, ee! and all of a sudden, shoo, you get the dip, and you know, it's what happens after the wedding. It's like, at the, before the wedding, it's like, oh, you're getting married, oh, and everyone's happy for you. And the day after the wedding's finished, you come to church, we pray for you, everyone go, next. <laughs> so you get this lull. So be careful you're not planning a competition instead of a wedding. Because what you're getting into is debt for people who really don't care about you, just for a moment's pleasure to say, I had 350 guests. And they spent all their money on themselves and you got nothing from it. And then after the wedding, you're both now looking for somewhere to live. And you're going back to those people, could you rent me a room? No. But you know what, a lot of couples, because they, they want to impress or it's, it's more for pride or what everybody else thinks, they get themselves into debt. That's not the way you start a marriage. Um, to, to start off and you've got, you, you're trying to build and you've, you've gone into it with this huge debt that you've put on this um, grand affair that was way, way outside of your budget. That's nonsense. And, you know, wisdom, wisdom says, I, I don't have to go and buy a designer dress. Amen. Talking to the ladies this Can morning. Ask, who, who is Vera Wang? She's a dis dress dis wedding dress designer. I hear, this th I hear this name come up all the time. Every time you hear wedding dress, Vera Wang. But you know, you know a lot of this stuff is we read these celebrity magazines. 
and we look at these celebrity magazines and we look at the labels they're wearing, you're not a celebrity. <laughs> That's the reality. You don't, you do not, hey, wake up call, you do not earn the money Victoria Beckham earns. So stop looking for him to give you a ring uh, like David Beckham gave her. You cannot wear a Vera Wang if, he, if you don't earn that kind of money. And you know, the re this is the reality of it. You know, people big up things, but it ain't that anything special. <laughs> I'm not putting it down, but there is a lot of dress that costs a whole lot less, that looks a whole lot more impressive. But we want, we want labels. You're not, tell your neighbor, you're not a celebrity. Maybe in your own eyes. <laughs> but, but can I ask you, how long, how long, and you might help me, how long does a woman actually wear a wedding dress for on the day? A few hours. Sorry? Five, six hours max. No, but don't some of you, then some of you, when you get married, go back and change into something else? Sometimes. I did. You I did. changed. So if, if I bought a Vera Wang, Vera Wang, or Vera Wang, if I bought a Vera Wang, if I bought a Vera Wang and you changed it after the ceremony... You better wear it for the next week. <laughs> that is like... <laughs> wear it on the plane. Isn't that stupidity? Wouldn't I be better off? Wouldn't I be better off investing that money in somewhere to live? Yeah. You see how stupid this is. Well, I said I said this the last time. Some of you ladies insist on wearing your house deposit on your finger. You go, you go and live in a rented accommodation. You live in something, and you're wearing the deposit. But on top, of, no, but, but worse than that. That's I not think, wisdom. But I think one of the things is, even worse than that, is that you look at someone who has already achieved in their life, and then you marry me, but I don't have the money that that man over there has. But then you're p trying to put that pressure on me to buy you a big ring. And I can just about visit Argus and get you something decent. But it's, it's the best of my ability. Now, what do you th how, do you think, how do you think that man would feel? How do you think I would feel if you put that pressure on me because someone back there has a diamond ring for 10 grand and I'm just earning over 10 grand a year? <laughs> re-educate. But but, but, yeah, re-educate. <laughs> but don't you think you should think about those things before you come into my life? Look at me, I am, I am a, I, a night shelf packer in Tesco's, but you like the way I look. When you look at me, you swoon. But then you blindside yourself and tell yourself, you're gonna change me from a night packer to be a city executive in, in the stock market. And you spend your life trying to change me. And it's going to cause conflict because that's not who I am. And you must understand, ladies, not all men want to climb the corporate ladder. Some men are actually happy just doing the job that they do without stress. And you have to think about that and talk about these things because if that man is happy doing what he's doing, and this is what some of you ladies do, you play God because you say, well, I will change him. You're not God. You cannot change anybody. So when a man, when you meet somebody and they're this level, and, you know, people say this to me. I've heard this so many times, not to me, but, but I've heard this, that I want my daughters to marry people with money. I've never said that. What I do say is I want my children to marry people with potential. Potential, you could be broke, but if you have potential, you're going to succeed. What I look for is when they're dating. When I see um, Sarah was, was engaged one time and I looked at the way her car was and I'm looking at the guy who's sitting in the car and even driving her car. Her car. He doesn't have a car. He's driving her car. And the windscreen is cracked in about 10 places. There's dents in the car. And the car wasn't like that when she met him. 
and the car's always dirty and he she drops him home and drives an hour to get home but that's concerning because when you're looking at that you have to say to yourself something is amiss here so you're looking for somebody with potential somebody that will take care of your child and you ladies need to start looking for potential and not trying to think how you can change the person let me tell you if a man doesn't have drive when he met you he's not gonna have drive after he met you Amen. Listen, listen to what scripture says in Philippians chapter 4 if you turn there with me Philippians chapter 4 we've got to get off of this designer stuff this competition stuff and I, I think sometimes us ladies are more prone to that stuff uh, most men are pretty easygoing um, but I think a lot of the times um, us ladies we read so many of these magazines that puts a fantasy in our head and we gravitate to fantasy we need to get back to reality ladies talking to you this morning we get into a place of fantasy that's not our world those magazines that we read about celebrities that is not the real world that's not our world and we need to stop with this designery thing and start and just get back to reality and get back to the simplicity of life get back to common sense amen, amen. and get your head out the clouds because some of us we are dreamers amen Philippians chapter 4 are you there Philippians 4 verses 11 to 13 says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, but I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in, wa in want. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. But when you look at that scripture that says, I can do all things through him that strengthens me, it looks, looks back, it talks about being able to live in whatever state I'm in. Hmm. We use that like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means I could be a doctor, I could be a lawyer. But the scripture is actually talking about, when you read the first two verses, he's talking about having the ability to live in a state of contentment. Amen. And then Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In other words, when I don't have, I'm okay. I can live in whatever state I'm in based on his grace. So if, if we don't have a lot, that's okay. But you, if, you don't, if you don't personally find in a, a place in your life where you could be content, you will always be dissatisfied. If you're always looking across at what other people have, you'll always be walking in competition and trying to catch up with other people. You can't live your life like that. It's going to create major, major problems for you both. Learn whatever. Ladies, if you marry a man and he's not a doctor and he's not rich, just be happy with who you, you have. That's who you married. You knew that when you married him, right? If you, men, if you marry a woman that is not a, a gourmet chef or she's not as smart as other women, there are women in this room that cannot cook. Did I say something wrong? No, you spoke the truth. They're just not owning up. But you see, <laughs> if, if I married my wife and she's, I knew before we married that she doesn't cook, can't cook, won't cook, then I knew that before I met her then if I still go ahead and marry her, I have to accept that as part of the contract. And that means I can't use that to cause arguments all the time. So if I know, you, you know, ladies, if you're marrying a guy now, he's a mummy's boy, he's, he wants to be a bachelor even after he's married, he likes to hang out with his friends, he disappears for days without, without telling you where he's going. If you know that and you still marry him, don't complain about what you allow. You get that? So if, thank God she does cook, but if she didn't, and I knew that, and I still went ahead and married her, then I have to learn to stay content with Domino's or KFC or whatever. So when Paul's talking about this, he's actually talking about learning to live in your means and learn to be content with what you have. You may never have a new car, but you know what, you're content. You know, but here's, here's the place of contentment. It's like you're not planning to stay there. 
Um, we, there was different stages that we were at throughout our marriage. We're coming up for 36 years this year. But you know what? There was places where we knew we were going somewhere. Um, we were content with where we were at. I was content with what he gave me um, when we got married, which was a wedding band. I didn't have an engagement ring. But you know what? As we grew and as we progressed, um, things get better. And that's, that's the purpose of having somebody in your life that is a visionary, because you're not going to stay here forever. And some, some of us today, when, uh, you know, young people, you get married, you want it all. You know, when we got married, we had no furniture. We had a chair that my mom gave me. We had a single bed. Some of you, you want the whole house and the furniture. You know, part of what builds a marriage is a fun and saving for stuff. It's the struggles in saving and, and saving up for a, for a bed. I remember we bought um, an air bed from Argos and we saved to buy a bed. Because one of the things we learned, it was because where we weren't content at one time, and we went and took all this stuff on finance. And we, were, we overstretched ourselves and we got into trouble trying to pay a mortgage, trying to pay all the finances for furniture. And we lost our home. So the next time around, we said, you know what, we're gonna, we learned contentment the hard way. And we learned, you know what, we're going to have to pump up this. Uh, well, we actually had an air bed for a, for a bed. And I remember we bought uh, one of these cane furniture things from Argos. You know, that like a conservatory furniture. That was our sofa. It was $1.99 at the time. But we said we were going to get a proper sofa and we saved. And I remember we saved and saved so that when we could afford it, we went and paid for it cash. There was no finance on it. And when it got delivered, it felt so good. We learned, we were very contented to sleep on an airbed on the floor until we saved up enough money to get the bed that we wanted. Amen? And is, you can't want it all up front. You can't want it all up front. You've been married for five minutes. You can't have it all up front. It's wonderful if you can, but in reality, the average person, it doesn't work that way. Amen? And we put, un, we put ourselves under unnecessary pressure because one of the things that causes divorce in a relationship is when there's financial problems. And when you put yourself under that kind of pressure, what are you doing? You're bringing something into your marriage that's going to put a pressure on you both, that's going to cause you to have arguments. So just take your time. There is no race. Come on, there is no race. The, who are you trying to impress by having the house furnished from top to bottom? You pick one room. And some of you, you, you don't even want to start with a one-bedroom flat. You want to start with a three-bedroom house and garden. It doesn't happen that way for the average person. Sensibility is, let's buy ourselves a one-bedroom flat. Let's ha leave enough room that we've got finances that we can still holiday we can still enjoy life. So we're not just working to pay a million bills, but we're, we can pay our mortgage and we can still go out for dinner. We can still go on holidays. We can still do fun things. I can still buy myself some shoes if I need them. But when you're so stretched, you've got holes in your shoes and you're having to put cardboard because you stretch yourself so thin that you can't afford. That's not wisdom. So you buy yourself, you start off. Visionary, you're not staying there. You're planning maybe three years up the road, well, we'll sell that, we'll buy a two-bedroom place. Maybe five, six years from now, we'll sell that and we'll buy a three-bedroom. Maybe later on, 10 years, 15 years, we'll get the bigger house with a garage, etc. You have a vision and you work towards it. So when you get that one-bedroom flat, you work on fixing one room. Amen? It's contentment, but it's using wisdom with it. And you're able to enjoy your marriage. You're able, those things help build you as a couple. Amen? When things come too easy, there's no real deep foundation. But it's those things that cause this foundation. We did this together. And there's that sense of achievement, that sense of accomplishment that we did this together. Amen. That causes a marriage to be strong. Amen. I just want to fast forward for a moment to go to the marriage because we did the last time we didn't actually cover marriage. Um, but I want to go forward a little bit, then we'll come back if we have time. 
to some of the other things like we're going to cover communication as well. But they say, I think it's two, two in every three marriages now are ending in divorce. This is not just in the world, it's also in the church. And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to do this more than once. Do you know what I mean? I, I would hate now after Danny's, um, she's 28 this year. Wow. Sarah's 31 this year. Dominic is 23 this year. Michelle is 36 this year. The very thought of going back to square one with somebody else and starting a family again is almost depressing. You ever play snakes and ladders? You ever play snakes and ladders? We played this together with Ashley and the, when you get to the top and you land on the snake's head and you, that, you know the one that takes you all the way back to go? That is so depressing. So I want to make sure that when we do this, it's a one shot. You aim for bullseye. And that means what we're going to do is cover all the bases before we commit. Now, when you get married, like now you're married. There are people in here who are probably in conflict with each other, even though you're married. There are probably, pe probably people in here, even though you've heard all of this, you're still holding on. And some of the things we've got to learn to do as married couples is deal with conflict. For instance, if I say to my wife, you're doing something I don't like, you should be able to say, okay, what is it? No, well, what, what, what about what you do that I don't like? Well, no, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you right now. Right? We're talking about you. There's certain things you do I don't like. I should be able, you should be able to say to me, what? <laughs> you are, you are, okay, honey, what? Remember you, how well done? You need to go home with me today. You didn't hear that, did you? You did? Okay. So I should so be what? Able... You should say nothing. Nothing. Okay. Forgive me, Father. But, <laughs> but I should be able to say, I, we should be able to say, look, you know what? Because um, I said to my wife, she thought food was my love language, and it's not. I really, was. It, that was many you years changed. ago. I know I changed, but look at how you change. <laughs> my God, you're talking about my change. My change is one. We used to run home from work for that my was, food. That was 36 years ago. I can't hardly run now <laughs> because I run home to your food. Okay. So food is not one of my love languages. You, know, you still like good food. Yeah, but what, liking good food now is not a matter of taste, it's age. Because when you get to my age, everything counts. So you don't want to eat something just for, like, you want to eat McDonald's just because you're hungry. Because mm. then you feel, you feel, you hate yourself. Why did I let this come in my body? And, and so now, when I eat, it's like, I want to eat something I'm going to enjoy. Because you understand, especially when you get to over 40 and 50, and you know everything you eat puts weight on you. So you want to eat something nice, but it's not a love. Okay. So I should be able to say to you, you know what, food is not my love language. And because she loves to cook. Now, there's a place for offense. Because she loves to cook, and I don't care whether she cooks or not. I'm just as happy with a salad or a corned beef sandwich. It makes no difference to me. I don't, when she cooks, I don't jump up and down like I used to and think, oh, what's next? You know, oh my God, what's she going to come out with next? Because in those days, you could enjoy the food. Because you ate it and you didn't notice it straight away. Mm. But today you eat a dessert and I've got the little scales. And you know, when no one's around, you put on your pajamas and you... And you, you run off the scales, so then you've got to fast again another day, so you can't really enjoy it. So I'm saying to you, so listen, ladies and gentlemen, you should be able to say to each other, what you're doing is not doing it. I don't like the way you speak to me in public. 
I should be able to say that, or she should be able to say that to me. You know what, the way you address me in public, I, I don't think it's, it's appropriate. And I should not get defensive over that. And one of the things that causes divorce is people don't know how to resolve conflict. Because if you want to be right all the time, then you're already wrong. Because you can't be right all the time. So it is a, watch what he says in Peter, Gentlemen, you're going to love this verse. And he never told the women this, it just told the men. It says in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. What knowledge? Dwell with them according to knowledge. Now, how many have ever taken a black cab? Black cab. A black cab driver takes between three to four years, sometimes more, to get their knowledge. What's the knowledge? Their knowledge is to know the roads, the building, the particular sites. So I should be able to get into a, a, a black cab and say to a cab, I want to go to number 10 Downing Street, and he shouldn't have to go through East London to get me there. He should be able to take me directly because he's done the knowledge. Watch this. For him to gain his knowledge, that black cab driver has to get out of his bed every morning, get on a moped in the freezing cold, in the hot sun, whatever the weather, he has to go on a moped with a list of names on his moped of places he has to be familiar with, and he has to look at each building, stop. You see them going around, very irritating people, getting your way. But they stop and they look at building and they tick things off and then they go back for different tests. I think it's about 11 different exams they have to take. And they, they will say to you, take me from Finchley Road to Buckingham Palace. And you don't just say, well, I'll go down the uh, Finchley Road, Swiss Cottage, down through Mal uh, uh, whatever, Baker Street and down Hyde Park. You have to tell them what is on the route. So they take that long to learn the knowledge. Now, God says we're supposed to live with our wives according to knowledge. What knowledge? That means as men, we've got to take the time to learn who she is. That sounds we... good. Carry on, sorry. You want to take over? No, that sounds good. I'm liking okay. what I hear. Okay. So that means I've got to take the time. You heard the song, take time to know her. It's not an overnight thing. You don't understand? Okay. So, <laughs> what we have to do, that's a proper song, by the way. What we have to do, men, instead of coming into a relationship and it's give me, I want, I need, it's supposed to be God didn't tell the woman to live with us according to knowledge. He told us to live with them according to knowledge. So it's my job as a man, as a husband, to take the time to know her and it's my job to try and understand her. And if I don't take that time, it means I don't know her, I don't understand her. That means my decisions every time I'm trying to please her or trying to get through to her is going to be wrong. Can I, can I just pause you there? This brings it back to the question that men always say, I don't understand my wife. You've just said, basically, in essence, I've not taken time to learn her. Every man that's ever said, you can't understand women, referring to his wife, you, own, you say that because you did not pass your knowledge. Now, I could ask a very simple question if you're dating somebody in here now. Uh, very simple question. I won't do it because I don't want to embarrass you and I don't want to break up your relationship. But I could say, stand up. And I should say to you, if you, or husbands, what's your wife's favorite color? You should be able to say red. I, I should say, what's her favorite food? You should be able to say Italian. Whatever it is. I should say, what does she, what does she like to do? You should say, instantly. She likes to go on holiday. She likes this, she likes that. You should be able to do it. If you don't know that, how are you going to make her happy? Because God specifically instructs us, and it gets worse than this. Because God takes the woman very serious. Because he said, I'm supposed to live with her according to knowledge. So I, I, many years ago, I said, is this okay? I mean, is this okay? You, you okay here? I saw you coughing there. It's not too much. Because I know he's getting married next month. And he thought he had it packed down. And now he's realized there's a whole other world to go through. So watch this. Now, what I'm supposed to do now, 
I'm so, I did this many years ago. I said to her, what is your dream? Tell me what your dreams are. And every, all through the years, I tried to make sure every dream she has come to pass. And when those are fulfilled, give me another list. And I take the time to understand. Some of the things like when we get out of the shower, she doesn't like when I leave the shower facing her. And she turns it on and it wets you up. She likes the shower head turned to against the wall so when she can turn the shower on and she gets in and decides when the water hits her. Simple thing. Simple thing. But it can make a bad day or a good day. You get it? Because when you, you see, again, you don't understand, man. For me, I get out of the shower. I, I don't blow dry my hair. I just brush it, a little bit of gel, and we're gone. Now, you got to understand, a woman does not do and gone. They wrap it. They put thing on it. Because if it gets wet, it's a major, major disaster. If that shower hits her in the face with her hair, that means it's not just walk out the door. It means now blow dry, tong, shh. Brush. You see, so I've got, to, I've got to now live according to knowledge. And am I telling you the truth? So I've got to take the time to really, really understand how does this intricate thing that God has made and placed in my life. You know, these, these projectors here cost a lot of money. These projectors can do things that none of the sound team know. It can do things, it has, uh, Elisha has shown us today, it has a, what do they call, where you, an USB. It has a USB, so we could probably put all our things on that camera. It's, it's a high-tech projector. But someone threw away the instructions. Won't say who. <laughs> but someone threw away the instructions. So because none of us know how this works, until we can order the instructions, we will never know the potential of what we have. And the manual for my wife is here. If I go to the manual, watch the, watch the manual says. This is my motivation, not about yours. What's my motivation? Because if God said it, you know, when God says something, pay, pay attention. He says, likewise, you husbands. How many husbands? Da -da. You can't skip out now. Dwell with them according to knowledge. Watch this. Giving honor unto your wife. You give her honor. We're supposed to honor her. How do I honor my wife? How do you honor your wife? I make her feel like she's a special person. When she's done dinner, I honor her. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. I know my wife many times when we all eat, she just sits there and waits for everyone to say, Mom, that was really nice. And then I know what she hates is when everybody gets up, which is a sign of great, great ungratitude. When she finishes cooking and everybody gets up and leaves the dirty dishes for her to wash. So I go and wash them most of the times. <laughs> Help me. Okay. But he says... Giving honor as unto the, to, unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel. So that means she shouldn't have to put the bin out because she's a weaker vessel. I filled it up. It was filled up feeding the family. So there's certain things in our house she doesn't have to do, and there's certain things in our house I don't have to do. But this is a scary part. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, watch what it says. What does it say? That your prayers, sorry, so men, let me help you now why some of your prayers are not being answered. When you dishonor your wife, when you don't take the time to know her, you develop a brass heaven over your life. That means your prayers go like this, Father in the name of Jesus, boom, boom. If you don't honor her, yeah, you, uh, so I, I could feel light bulbs coming on all over the room. Because when we don't honor her, God will not honor us. 
So that means I'm not only going to take time to know her, and my life should be spent trying to make her happy. Not me sitting back and her trying to make me happy. Because the Bible did not tell the women to honor their husbands in that way. It didn't tell the women to live with, with your husband according to knowledge, because we're quite simple. Food. <laughs> Sorry, what, what was the next one? What do we need? We need food. Shalom, what do we need? Singing. Okay. <laughs> so we live with them according to knowledge. So as men, men, you've got to go home with a pen and paper and you've got to ask some questions. What do I do that irritates you? I'm going to stop it today. How about that? I know I don't irritate you. Why? Because I live with her according to knowledge. I've stopped all the irritating stuff. At this point, my wife says, <laughs> Amen. Amen. You got anything to say on that? Well, uh, you know, while you're reading that, <laughs> keep your finger in First Peter and just flip back a little bit into Ephesians for me. Oh, this is good. This is something for the women to do now. Because we've got keep we've got balance, right? And I know that us wives we were loving that bit just now. We will want to make sure we keep the balance. Ephesians chapter five, verse twenty-two. Say amen when you're there. Amen. You're there. Okay. See, we normally take scripture out of context. Husbands usually know this scripture more than the wife because this is a scripture that most husbands will quote to their wives. That woman, you need to submit to me. But we f you fail to do the other part of honoring her and um, living with her according to knowledge. So when we balance it, then it, the, the, it brings harmony into our marriage. The, w the scripture to us ladies is wives, we're to submit ourselves to our husbands as we do to the Lord. So there, there, there is a level of submission as we, the same way that we submit to God. So as a wife, I can't be talking to God, but then I don't talk to my husband. I can't be going before God and singing songs of worship and adoration and then because we're not talking, I'm balancing on the edge of the bed. And I don't want to, I don't want to touch him because, you know, we've, we've, we're not talking. You with me? Am I nailing you? That's okay. But, you know, this is what we do. And I, I've learned that you can't go and be one way with God and you're out of sync with your partner and think that's okay. Because it's not. I can't go before God and I'm crying and I'm weeping and I'm worshipping. And then I get up from there, holy me. Go to my bedroom. <coughs> I can't talk to him. <coughs> Excuse me. He, he's in bed. Excuse on his water. corner. I'm fine. I'm fine. Take it. I'll give you water. <laughs> See, some of you ladies don't let, yeah, but you don't let us do for you. Yeah, but I'm, I'm in front of the whole congregation. <laughs> how can you do that? How, how can you do that? Thank you. Front, thank now, you. How, how, front, people watching live Tell around the world. Tell him thank you for me. It's all right. It's all right. Okay. They said thank you. Wow. <laughs> okay. 36 years. It's still working, you see? You never arrive. But, you know, you can't, you can't do that, girls. You can't go, you, we know what scripture says. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. I'm living with him, I'm submitting to him as I'm, I am to the Lord. When we do something wrong with God, we're supposed to be quick to put it right, quick to repent. 
It's the same thing when we're with our husbands. Whatever it is, we should be quick. That's part of submission. Yeah. You're quick question, to repent. Question, question, question. Mm -hmm. Let's go here some a little bit. Okay. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands unto the Lord. Suppose I backslide. I don't read my Bible. I don't pray. I'm not close to God. And in my insanity of drawn away from God, I say to you, I don't like this church anymore. Let's go. What do you do? That, well, well, that's not the kind of submission I'm talking about. I'm saying the scripture says, submit yourself to your husbands as unto the Lord. No, but when you so, say submission. But there's a scriptural, there's a no, scriptural. But when, you say, when you say submission, mm -hmm. men are hearing this like submit, like slave. <laughs> do what I say, not what I do. Do you want to clarify that? Okay. okay. Because the difference is, when, when men hear this, I've heard men use this so many times on their wife. Submit. I've heard men use it. All the time, mm -hmm. right. No. So now, submitting to a man that is a leader is easy. Mm. Now, I believe that the spiritual head should always lead. But if a man abdicates his position yeah. as the spiritual head, the wife automatically takes over as a spiritual head. Because if the man is not walking in his position, it means someone has to lead the family spiritually. Mm -hmm. So when, when like, I, we've never had a problem with submission. Mm -hmm. We've never had that problem because um, I never have to say, I'm the leader, follow me. Mm -hmm. um, some of you, when you're shouting out in your home, I am the head of this house, the Bible says you must submit. You are... It means that you're not a leader, you're a follower. Because anyone that's truly a leader never has to tell people, follow me. People just follow. So when, when like for instance, <clears throat> I've seen men where they get offended and they just decide, well, I'm taking my wife, I'm taking my children, and we're leaving church around the world. So as a woman, do you allow your husband to destroy your whole family? Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah. So somewhere the wife, I, be, I believe, because your submit is unto the Lord. Yeah. So somewhere the wife has to stand up and say, no, I'm not leaving God for you. Yeah. And by taking, okay, let me give you the example. Let me give you, yourself. Remember, she gets saved in a Pentecostal church in the middle of what they call convocation or conference. Every day, She's in the church. Now, my first image of church is like, oh my God, this is an everyday thing. Because I didn't know what church was. So every, more, every time I come in, she's running out the door, little skull cap on her head, running to church. And I'm thinking, this is like every day. I didn't know about convocation or conference. It's just every day she's in church. So I says, you know what? Make sure my food is cooked before I come home. Make sure my clothes is ironed. And you did that, right? You submitted. You submitted. But then I gave her the choice. It's me or the big man. Stupid. I mean, duh. The big man could have said, you know what? <laughs> Your candle's gone out. <laughs> we did some stupid things. But then she done something I was not used to. She didn't submit to me in that area. She cooked my food, she done my clothes, she done everything a wife is supposed to do. But when it came to choosing between me and God, she chose God, which is the right decision. She did not submit to me on that level. And because she did not submit, I'm standing here today. But it, we can take that further in the, within the church. If, if a man isn't in a relationship with God, you can be a Christian, you're coming to church, but you have no relationship with God. How can you be leading? How can you be leading when you are not in fellowship with God? And there are men in here, you, 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 you have the title Christian, 
You attend church, you come to church, but you in your personal time have no relationship with God. How can you be leading me, and, uh, and, and want to have your family submit to that? You have no vision because if you're not in relationship with God, you're not getting his blueprint, you're not getting direction from him in which direction to lead your family. But leading spiritually is more than just making decisions. Mm. You understand, <clears throat> the reason why it has to have someone leading the home spiritually is because the Bible says the principalities, the power, spiritual wickedness, rules of the darkness, there's demonic activity coming against your home and against your life. There's demonic forces that want to destroy your life. The Bible says Satan's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And if, if the man is not taking his position, that means if the wife doesn't take her position, it means Satan can come in and do whatever he wants in your home. So there's always got to be a spiritual leader. And whether it be the man or the woman, someone has to take, a, account, take accountability for the home. And that means as if I'm not in my position, then the woman has to stand up and say, you know what, Satan, you're not going to have my home. You're not going to have my children. You're not going to have my family. Because if I abdicate my position and she abdicates her position, it means there's no defense for demonic forces to come in to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So somebody has to stand up and take the reins and say, no, this family is going for God. You get that? So when we talk about submission, we're not talking about just doing whatever the man tells you to do. You, you, and when he says, you can't see your family, that's nonsense. That's not submission, that's stupidity. When he says, you, you, you can't go to work, you can't have a career. Well, no, I, I want a career. Submission doesn't mean you become dumb, stupid, and blind. Submission means that when you're doing your godly thing, you don't even have to discuss submission with me because I'm already submitted. Most women do not want to handle bills and creditors and make decisions. They want to look, do their makeup, do their face, look, buy their clothes, and be happy in following you. But they will follow you if you're the leader. Is that right? So that's what, what I say submission is when, you, when you are men, when we are doing what we're supposed to do, my children, I don't have a problem with my children, you know, in the home, they, they are, you know, they, they are, they don't rebellious, they don't fight me, um, well, we, we let, don't let me, let me give an example, I mean, in, within our relationship, if I will do everything in my power as a wife to, to do things that honor him, um, do his meals, take care of the home, take care of the children, take care of his laundry, etc. But if he's in a place where he's not in the place of relationship with God that he should, it's very hard to submit to that. Does that make sense? It's very hard because if he's not connecting with God, if he's not hearing from God like he should and he's in a spiritually cold place, where is he leading us? So there, there, there comes a place where, and I know for me, it's like I've always wanted to be in a strong place spiritually. It was a decision I made a long time ago to be in a strong place spiritually so that if anything ever happened in his life, I wanted to be able to be strong enough to be able to hold the family in, a, in that place till he was back on his feet. So many of us women today, we throw away or we don't um, determine to build a spiritual strength and relationship within ourselves with God so that if anything happens with our husbands or if he's not where he should be, we're not in a place to pray it through. We're not in a place to carry it through. We, we, never, we should, ladies, we should never, ever, ever get to the place where our spirituality is reliant on our husbands. I'll say that again. I said we should, as women, married women, we should never think that now I'm married, I can relax on my spirituality, that I'm reliant on this man to carry me spiritually. No, no, no. That's totally wrong. Supposing something happened to your husband tomorrow, where would you be? Your, your strength as a woman determines what happens to your family. We were talking about this in mentoring today that, you know, you often hear the saying that the backbone of every family is the wife. Because you remove that and most families fall apart. 
So I would encourage you as women of God, don't think, you know, oh, I can relax now. I'm married. This man's going to take care of all the spiritual stuff. No, you need to develop that for yourself. You need to be strong, a strong woman. Because it's no longer just this man. Every man deserves a strong spiritual woman. And I would say to the men, don't be scared of a strong woman. Because you don't know when you're going to need her strength to walk through a tough time. Amen? So don't throw away your strength because there's times when um, people, we go through different phases where we're not always on point with God. Come on, it's reality. We're not always 100%. We go through lapses. We've gone through periods where we're not reading. We're not praying. We're not hearing from God like that. But you know what? A, a woman that's on, on the word in relationship with God, you're praying back up there. You may not be able to say anything to him. He may not receive. But you know what? You learn to get on your face and you push. Sometimes you have to do your pushing in the spirit until that man gets back on track with God and starts leading again. Because there's certain times in a marriage where it's, it just gets stagnant spiritually because he's lost his vision for a moment. But you know what? When he's back on track again, we can start moving again. Amen. Amen? So, but if you're both dense spiritually, you're going to perish. Amen. There's a lot more we could say today, but we're going to end it now. But there's so much more. You know, we take a, everything we do, we need a, a license. If we drive a car, we have to go to driving school. We have to do highway codes to learn how to drive safely on the roads. Um, if we want to learn to fly an airplane, it's even more intense because you've got to do exams and exams because they understand that once they give you a license, you could actually kill people with it. Um, whatever we want to do, if you want to be a doctor, nobody just goes out and become a doctor. There was one the other day uh, um, in the newspapers or something, the, the Nigerian lady who went to get the injection at the bottom, just be content with where you are, and it killed her because she went in some hotel and some weirdo injected her with stuff that killed her. Um, but generally, if you want to be a proper doctor, you have to have exams. Anything in life you want, you want to do, you normally have to qualify and pass exams. But to be husbands and wives, there's no exams. There's no qualifications. And because of that, we go out and just do it blind without taking the time to really sit with people who can advise us. The Bible says there's safety in the multitude of counselors. And some of you are afraid to ask questions because you're afraid that it's going to break up. If, if it's going to break up over asking questions, baby, it ain't worth it. Amen. Because if God puts you together, you don't have to be afraid of anyone breaking it up. If God puts you there, no one can break it. But if you're afraid to challenge and to ask questions, it means that you're insecure about the relationship. You should be able to sit with people and they should be able to ask you questions and challenge you why you're doing this. I always say to people, why are you getting married? And they say, oh, uh, we're best friends. That won't keep you together. Oh, we love each other. That won't keep you together. Oh, we just get on so well. That won't keep you together. Oh, they're just perfect for me. We're, we're two of a kind. That won't keep you together. The only thing that will keep you, I'll tell you what will keep you going, is when you know without a shadow of a doubt, without one ounce of doubt, that this is the perfect, absolute will of God for our lives. That means I will stay together based not on how she is because you know the times we love each other the times we we talk most times we talk but once in a while she will upset me or i'll upset her and at that point if you don't know that god has called you together you'll divide so don't be afraid to ask people and challenge each other and ask why do you want to marry me ask the question when a guy says to you will you marry say to me why say, say to him why 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 do you why do you want to marry me you, some of you are so like, oh my God, no, don't say that, Pastor, don't say that. Oh no, oh, he asked me, he asked me. Oh yes, 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 yes. It's called desperation. Don't be so desperate. Enjoy your single life. If a man says to you, will you marry me? Say, why? Give me five good reasons. Why should I join myself to you? What, what, is, what difference are you going to make in my life that I don't have now? Apart from give you children. But what else are you going to add to me? 
And, and you men, if a woman starts talking about marriage and marriage, say to her, why would I want to marry you? What, what could you add to my life? How would you enhance my life? And she says, well, I'll cook for you. But that's not enough. I need more than that. Well, I dress nice. You won't always look the way you look today. That's subject to change. And go a bit deeper and find out what is actually in the heart of the individual. And then you could make a decision and then get counsel and have someone who has nothing to gain and nothing to lose and find out, are we right for each other? I've told people straight up front, you're not right for each other. I had one woman come to me with some sailor and the sailor is a sailor. Who wants to marry a sailor? And I, says, I looked at him, I said, so you're not even a Christian, are you? He goes, no. I said, ma'am, the Bible clearly tells you you should not be unequally yoked together an unbeliever. I said, if you marry this man, you're going to be miserable. What did she do? She left her children here and went off to Canada with him, married him. Thing is, you never get to see them after the effect. Because you say, well, we got married and we're happy. It's only been six days, darling. Give it six years. And then come back and say, we're happy. And it will never, you take oil and water, put half oil in the jar, in the bottle, put half water, put in one of those machines they use in Starbucks, shake it, shake it for a year. At the end of a year, the water will still go one way and the oil will go another way. They will never mix. You can mix a Christian and a non-Christian together. It will never, never work. Stand to your feet with me today. Some of you look depressed. Amen. Next to accepting Christ as your Savior, this is one of the major, major decisions you'll ever make in your life. Some of you men, you need to change. That's why you're still single. You, you're so rigid. Some of you women, you're also so rigid that you, you won't change. And if you can't be changeable, why would God give you somebody? Amen. And some of you are so determined to have it what you want rather than say, God, give me what you know I need. Amen. Yeah. Amen. God knew what I needed when I got married. And we submit that to him even to today. You see couples and you just say, that's a match. You see others mismatch. Like a donkey and a racehorse right, pulling the same card. <laughs> On equal the oat. The stallion is up here and the donkey is plodding along. And the stallion said, come on, come on. And the donkey says, I'm, I'm not in the mood. I'm not in the mood. It's unequally yoked. Get two stallions together, they're gone. Get two donkeys together, they go. But they move together. You say amen? Bow your heads with me today. I hope this has helped you today. Please understand the things we say to you. We're already married, very, very, very extremely happily married. I look at my wife every day, I thank God. I look at her walking across the room, I watch her getting changed, I, get, I watch her getting dressed. I love the way, I watch her doing her hair sometimes, I sit on my bed reading my Bible, and just watch her in the mirror, she's doing her hair, and I talk to her. She's a great distraction in my life because it, you know, it's hard to be thinking about anything else when she's around me. I love it, uh, 36 years, it seems like just a few years have gone by. I love, love, love being married. So when we speak to you, we want you to not be married for five years or three years. But we want you to be able to come up here in your ministry when we're dead and gone and say to people, there was a couple one time that used to teach on this stuff. And because of what they said, we now are celebrating 30 years. We now are celebrating 40 years. It is our desire to see you married but a greater desire is to see you marry the right person. Amen. Nothing, I cannot think of anything worse on this earth than going up an aisle with a stranger you don't know and waking up and regretting the decision for the rest of your natural life. It's a nightmare. So what we tell you is to help you, not to condemn you or to judge you or to put you down, but we truly and sincerely want the best for you. In all our years, we've seen so many people that were married and have divorced and separated. And we always said we will never divorce, never divorce. And if you stay together long enough, you go past that point of anger and you go into another realm where you come out the gloom and the darkness and you come into another season in your life. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? 
I would ask you today before we close, if you were to die today, where would you go? Where would you spend eternity? When you ask that question, people have many different answers. Some say, I'll go to heaven, I hope. Some say, I think I'll go to heaven. The decision between life and death is not something you should be hoping for or guessing at. When you die, you need to know for surety what's going to happen to you when you die. Now, you may say, well, you know, I tell you, Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth, Jesus is the life. You may say to me, well, I don't believe that. I believe that many roads lead to one God. Well, you know, they said one many years ago that if a man ran a four-minute mile, his heart would burst. Just believing that does not mean it's going to be reality for you. Here's a fact. Whatever religion you tell me you belong to, you tell me how that religion will deal with the sin in your life. And you say, I have no sin. Let me tell you what. Every man is born into sin. Every man, woman, every child is born into sin. A religious leader came to Jesus one night and says, we know that no man can do the works you do except God be with him. He said, what should I do? What must I do to be saved? Jesus said, except a man be born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of heaven. He says, how can I be born twice? How can I enter my mother's womb the second time? Jesus said, you must be born of the Spirit of God. In other words, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, man died spiritually. Jesus went to the cross and paid the price for mankind's sins. Jesus said, except a man be born again. In other words, unless you accept the redemptive work that was done at Calvary, where Christ went to the cross, an innocent man and crucified for the sins of the world, unless you come through him, there is no heaven. He said it this way. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He said, no man comes to the Father but by me. You could look out to religions, but there's no religion that can help you. In fact, religion has caused more wars and more deaths than anything else. Christianity is not religion. Christianity is relationship. It is a relationship with the God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. I want to ask you today, I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. You say, I don't believe in him. Well, you know what? One day you're going to die and you're going to find out how real he is. But the sad thing is, when we die, we don't get a second chance to come back. We don't come back as an animal or a fly. When we die, the Bible says, appointed unto man wants to die, and then the judgment. You have no idea what it will be to stand in front of Almighty God and His judgment seat. Today, I want to pray a simple prayer with you. It goes like this. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I repent of my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior from this day forward. My, the moment you pray that prayer, every sin will be forgiven. Your name will be entered into the Lamb's book of life. The blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from every sin. But he will not come by force. He will only come by invitation. And I say to you today, I want to pray with you. This is what I want you to do. If you're saying, yes, Jesus, come. I want you to be my Lord. I want my name written into the Lamb's book of life. I want every sin I've ever committed to be washed away, wiped away, forgiven. If that's you, you say, yes, preacher, that's me. Then I want to pray that prayer with you today. Father, in the name of Jesus, I repent of my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior from this day forward in Jesus' name. You're saying, that's me, preacher. Would you slip your hand right up above your head? I want to pray for you right where you stand. Raise your hand as high as you can. God bless you. I see your hand over there. Anybody else? I see your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody? I see your hand back there. God bless you. It's your choice. It is your choice. When you die, you say, well, I, I, don't, I don't know. My friend, let me tell you. I saw hell. I'd just been saved and I saw hell. I went to the mouth of hell and I heard the screams 
of people who were lost for eternity. People whose souls had been lost for eternity because they thought that this was all there was to life. God bless you. And I know that this thing is so real. Would you risk your life? Would you risk eternity on this? I'm going to pray now. If I've missed anyone, slip your hand up where you are. You say, I've, I've missed, you've missed me. Okay, we're going to pray. You ready? Would you bow your heads where you are and pray after me? Say with me. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I repent of my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Amen. Look. Thank you for tuning into our program today. We pray that it's been a blessing to you. If you would like more information on our church, please log on to www.v2vchurch.org. That's www.v2vchurch.org. Alternatively, you can call us on 08000 64 That's 08000 64 our service times are every Sunday at 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. for the youth service. We also have midweek service on Wednesday evenings at 7.30 p.m. We look forward to you joining us. Have a great day.